My path to understanding happiness began when I arrived at Harvard Business School in 2000. We were asked to self-divide into study groups that would meet each morning before school. So I went up to the first group of students and asked if I could join them. And they asked me about my accounting and finance skills. I had none. I thought, isn't that what we're here to learn? Then I went over to the next group, and they let me in, only the next day they kicked me out when they discovered they had too many people. I soon realized that I was going to be the kid that got picked last in dodgeball every single time. And that was my intro to business school. And let me tell you, getting picked last as an adult hurts just as much as it did in the fourth grade. This continued for a while until I found three other students and our unlikely lot became a study group of misfits. But there was something that I was really good at. I could spot the CEOs who came through to speak to us. I could spot the ones with a spark beyond their job title. And with my peers, there were so many of them that were passed over as uncool or unusual, and I could spot the stars among us. So, upon graduating, I will tell you that any time to this day that someone mentions discounted cash flow, I get hives. <laughs> but if you mention, if you mention leadership, I get goosebumps. I'm going to take a sip of water. Much better. Thank you. So upon graduation, I started a firm to focus on those CEOs and executives who came through, the ones with the spark. And my timing couldn't have been better. I launched a branding firm where I helped them with their speeches and their press and everything having to do with their personal brands. And the best part was at the time, it was the early 2000s and there was an explosion of media channels that all needed content for their cable news and the internet. And so they needed these experts. They needed the celebrity chef, the celebrity CEO, and that was who I represented. And this was the birth of personal branding. Pretty soon, I became their chief confidants, and that was my sweet spot. The New Yorker in me didn't just walk fast and talk fast, I solved problems fast. You know how you sit in your hairstylist chair and you spill your dark, deep secrets? That was me. It wasn't just my job, but it was my passion. But after a while, I noticed something. No matter how hard these people worked, there was something holding them back. It was an invisible brick wall. It wasn't about more achievements or more press. It was the other things going on in their life. For the CEO, it was a lost connection to her husband. For the chef, it was extreme loneliness. For the Olympian, it was parenting trouble. And for the doctor, it was financial stress. It wasn't about their workout routine or their leadership style. It was about the other areas of their life. It wasn't about achievement. It was about fulfillment. They were leading unfulfilling lives. Aha, so I had identified the problem. Well, 15 years later, 15 years of this journey, I've now worked with thousands of people. I've worked with administrative assistants and engineers, people getting back into the workforce, and recent college graduates. And I have found that this problem stretches among all of us. We say, when he proposes, I'll be happy. If I lose 10 pounds, I'll be happy. If I could just afford that house, I'll be happy. When I get into law school, I'll be happy. We're swimming to an ever-moving buoy. And this problem extends to the mom who overparents, the dad who overcoaches, your workaholic boss. We are all aiming for something that we can't 
get to. So, what to do about it? Well, here's what I've learned. This is not about achievements. This is not about more accolades. This is not about just focusing on one or two areas of your life so you can really perfect them. It's not about just working and working out. It's not about just being with your kids and your partner and focusing on them. It's about embracing all seven areas of your life. Your health, your career, your hobbies, your community, your friends, and your relationship. It's about your family. It's about all seven slices. The, the most fulfilled people among us are those that are involved in all of those areas. Now, when you hear that, you might think, sure, of course, career is super important. I have to feed my family. And health is really important. But hobbies and friends and community? Well, a 2006 study of breast cancer patients showed that those with 10 or more friends had a four times higher survival rate than those with less than 10 friends. Then they did the same study with partners, and they found that partners had zero impact on survival rates. Now, I'm not throwing your partners under the bus. <laughs> I am a little bit. But your friends could save your life. So say yes to that girl's night out, okay? You're doing it for your whole family. <laughs> and when it came to hobbies, social scientists put heart monitors on 100 people while they were doing their hobbies. And they found that their heart rates dropped 34% while doing a hobby, and their sadness levels dropped 18%. And these effects lasted hours beyond the hobby. They mirrored the effects of exercise. So there are no optional slices. You need all of them. But what's holding us back? Well, the media, the media tells us that we should have a scale, work-life balance. But for a scale to be in balance, you have to spend equal time at work and at home. And if you have a thriving career, you're never doing that, so you fail. Then we're told to juggle. Who here has ever tried to have a conference call with a toddler in the room? <laughs> Juggling is just not possible, so we fail. And then we're told we can either have it all or we can have nothing. Again, we fail. Anytime we are striving for an unattainable ideal, we're failing. And that leads me to perfection. We've all done it. We see the woman in line ahead of us at Starbucks, or in the playground, or in the boardroom, and we say she has a better life than I do. She's healthier, wealthier, she has a better career, a better body, a hotter husband, the life I want. But life is not an a la carte menu, it's a package deal. And if you had her treasures, you would also have her troubles. If you had that body, you might be battling melanoma. If you had that career, you might be involved in a three-year lawsuit. So it's not about striving for these other, other people's lives. In the age of Facebook, it's easier than ever to compare our lives to other people's highlight reels. So what happens when we replace perfection with participation. Suddenly, it's about attendance in every slice. It's about going to dinner with a friend, even if you're leaving a messy house behind. It's about forgiving yourself for forgetting things. And it's about giving yourself permission to be imperfect. We are finally giving you that participation trophy. It's just about showing up for every slice. And if perfection has a partner, it's guilt. If perfection is our roadblock to fulfillment, guilt is a predator eating you alive. Of all the women I interviewed for my last book, from Shonda Rhimes to Gail King to Sally Krawcheck, they spent almost no time feeling guilty. Guilt is only a predator. When you were with your friend, the last time you went out with a friend, what if I told you your friend only showed up out of guilt? How would that make you feel? 
Any recipient of our guilty decision is a victim. And it's impossible to feel present when we're feeling guilty. If you're at work, but you feel like you really should be home, then you're not really present at work. And if you are at home and you feel like you should really be on that conference call, you're not really present with your family. I know this firsthand. Last year, I was on my book tour. It was November 1st. And my daughter, Ruby, my middle child, was homesick. And you know how hard it is to leave a sick child behind. But I got her settled, and I got to the airport, and I was determined to just focus 100% on my work. I was going to Minneapolis. So I get on the plane, really focused, and suddenly my phone rings. And I didn't even know phones could ring on an airplane. And I was in coach middle, and everyone's staring at me, how, who's this person with the phone ringing? And I look down, and it's my child's school. So I pick up, and it's not just school, but it's my older daughter, Ella. She said, Mommy, it's November 1st, and you forgot to order me lunch. And if you forgot to order me lunch, you probably forgot Bowen's lunch, too. That's her kindergarten brother. So here I was in the air with two starving children and one sick child. And I was going to give a talk on work-life balance across the country. <laughs> talk about imposter syndrome. So the teacher gets on the phone, and she said, um, don't worry, we'll feed the kids Cheez-Its. <laughs> so that day, my kids had Cheez-Its for lunch, and I implore you to save the guilt for those Cheez-It moments, okay? Because that was a day I deserved to feel guilty. So now that we're going to abandon the guilt and the quest for perfection, we can really dig into our slices. And what's important to realize is that all of your sizes of slices are going to change over time. You probably don't have as much control over your time as you think. You might have a sick parent, and that takes time. You might have to earn two incomes to feed your family, and that takes time. You might have decided to live in a beautiful neighborhood with great schools, but a really long commute from work, and that takes time. How we allocate our time is usually based on long-term decisions we don't have much control over. Instead, it's about just acknowledging each slice, even if it's just a sliver today. In the career slice, it might be it's setting a goal. So it might be you know, going to a networking event once a month. And with your partner, it might be setting aside 20 minutes a day just to catch up, which can do wonders for your marriage. With your parenting, it might be just an hour tech-free a day where you're really focused on your kids. It might be going to the book club even if you haven't read the whole book. It's about participating in each slice. And once you set a goal to each slice, that's when they really start existing, a goal and an action item. That's all it takes. These seven slices are your foundation for a fulfilling life. And the great thing about applying the pie method to your life is that you'll feel a whole lot lighter We've all done it. We lie in bed at night, and we have a rotisserie of worries, right? You're worried about the upcoming presentation at work, and your sick dog, and the fight you had with your partner, and we worry and worry. When you apply the pie method to the rotisserie, suddenly gratitude is baked into your pie, because it's impossible not to acknowledge all of your slices, and you're going to find ones that are going well. And suddenly, you can be grateful for your supportive group of friends or your amazing kids. And listen, your, your life is going to be messy, sometimes multiple times, all in the same day. The most delicious pies are not the store-bought, perfect-looking ones. They're the messy, gooey, dripping over the side ones. And that's what your life is supposed to look like. It's about embracing all seven slices of your life. It's about giving enough oxygen to each one so that they start living. You have all the ingredients you need. You have a complete life. And that's what fulfillment is all about. And that is what's going to make you happy. Thank you.